Hey, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, IoT is such an interesting area with so much expansion and potential in the near future. And I think Erlang is perfectly placed to be a key player in its success. So uh, I guess with that in mind, we're really thrilled to have today's guest in to talk to you about what he's been working on. Uh, Alejandro Romalo is the CEO of LeakSight and they've developed Bondi, an open source networking platform uh, for distributed microservices and IoT applications that is written in Erlang. Uh, Bondi is currently being used to interconnect the components of an IoT platform that has been in production for two years with hundreds and thousands of connected vehicle and home devices. Uh, before I hand over to Alejandro, who will tell you more about Bondi, uh, I'd just like to remind you that we absolutely love hearing from you. So please do tweet us as you follow along with the webinar at Erlang Solutions. Uh, and if you have any questions, we will be doing a Q&A after. So you can submit them either on Twitter or in the questions box of the webinar. Um, as always, we're recording this and the recording and slides will be over to you on email and on the Erlang Solutions website in the coming weeks. Uh, so now with the formalities done, I'll hand over to Alejandro. We're really excited to see what you've got. Hi, Anthony. Thank you very much for having me. Um, thanks everybody for for being here. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go through a number of uh, slides in the presentation, but I'm gonna start switching to showing you a little bit of um, code and, and, and Bondi running. Uh, so, but first I need, I need to uh, let you know a little bit about um, what is it that, we, that we're doing with it uh, and also why we've done it. Um, so what I'm gonna cover is the background. I'm gonna briefly introduce what we call the Magenta IoT platform. Um, what is a web application messaging protocol? how Bondi implemented, and we're gonna see code along uh, running. So Magenta is a result of our collaboration at LeapSight with uh, LoJack, uh, Latin America, a company that um, has been operating Latin America, South America for 20 years. And what they mainly what they do is vehicle theft uh, recovery um, by using um, a device that is in, in installed in the vehicle, and if, if the vehicle is, is, um, is robbed, then they can track and, 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 and recover that, that, uh, that vehicle. Now, two years ago, they approached us with um, one, um, with, with, a, with a vision of what is now called Strix, uh, which is a product that integrates the connected cars and home devices. So basically, the confluence of the smart home and, and, and your cars. So we developed uh, this platform uh, it's been in production for nearly two years. We have almost 100,000 connected vehicles reporting 30 million daily GPS signals. And we have around 3,000 connected home devices. Those are home alarms, video cameras, and smart switches. All of those connected devices are managed through a single uh, mobile application by the, by the end user. And, and he can do a bunch of stuff that I'm gonna show you in the next slides. So the application basically collects signals. Uh, we call those signal streams. So some of those devices are constantly talking uh, to us, such as, for example, the, the connected cars. All those signals are implemented in different proprietary protocols. Uh, what we do is we have a number of gateways that will understand those, um, those signals and then transform those signals into a canonical um, signal that then flows within the Magenta platform. And as any IoT platform, Magenta has a representation of the, um, of the thing that we have connected, in this case, a car or a home alarm system. Um, so we store a representation so that the user can go and get that representation and understand whether, for example, if the alarm is um, armed or disarmed or if the vehicle is in the right location. Um, also, what the user does is it configures a number of rules that we call agents. Um, all those agents are evaluated in real time every time the signal goes. And that, that path that you're watching at the moment is what we call the, um, the signal to, uh, to shadow or the signal to thing uh, path. 
once the agent is evaluated, it might or might not generate an event, and the event um, might get notified to the user based on his preferences. So, for example, as a user, I can set up a number of G offenses and for um, it, and get notified every time one of my vehicles, motorcycle or a bike, gets in or out of those geofences. I can also set up limits on speed. So if I want to get notified when my, uh, uh, with my son is driving more than 120 miles per hour, then I get that notification and I decide when and how uh, I will get that notification. All of this happens in, in real time. So as a summary, Magenta is an IoT platform that combines people and things and allows you to connect to things using different protocols, um, cloud to cloud or directly uh, with, with those things. We developed an open REST um, API and WAMP API. For those of you who don't know what WAMP is, I'm going to cover that later on. So it's a cloud uh, platform that is implemented mostly um, using microservices and most of the microservices are written in Erlang, uh, although we have microservices in Node.js and Python. Uh, most of those are dockerized and run within a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and basically there are four key characteristics that we want to maintain and, uh, as, uh, from an architectural point of view. And there is a platform that needs to operate always on. From a user's perspective, this should always be running. Uh, it should be real time, so there is no use of getting an event that is two minutes away from uh, from from the the, the when, when the event happened. So basically, those are the kind of things that are more most important to the users. And then, obviously, from our point of view, it needs to be ad adaptable. So we need to be able to move from cloud to cloud. We need to be able to allow the integration of new protocols and devices. So. In that thing to shadow signal path, we have uh, in this case, um, I'm going to use a, a car as, a, as an example. Um, so we, what, we, what we use is a publish and subscribe um, programming model. So we have the device connecting to the gateway, the device produces some signals. If the device, in this, in this particular case, if the device cannot get connected either because of the 3G, 4G connection being down or because the gateway is down, um, then the device will store the signals in the buffer, uh, in its own internal buffer. Uh, and that gives us a lot of um, uh, leeway in terms of how we design the architecture for this particular path. And that's the reason why we're using Kafka. So basically, every time we collect a signal, the signal goes into Kafka, and then we have a number of microservices that will consume the signal. Uh, if in the event that the gateway cannot speak to Kafka, then uh, it won't um, acknowledge that signal to the device and then the device will buffer and will try resending that same signal. So in, in this case Kafka as a messaging platform works very well for us because we have the backup of the buffer in, in terms of, of the device and Kafka can go down if for example Zookeeper is, 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 is down and those things uh, happen and, and but since we have the buffer in the device, then this path is a happy path because we always have a way of getting back to and recover the data uh, from the device. Also, Kafka gives us obviously the benefits of queuing the data and allowing the processors and the shadow um, uh, service to uh, consume all those signals uh, at their own pace. Um, and this is very important because in the event of a, an outage in the network, for example, which happened to us multiple times, um, so all these signals will come as a tsunami uh, to the platform. So, for example, if those cars um, in a particular market are disconnected because of an outage in the network for 12 hours, then they have 12 hours of signals the device are going to try and push the next time they connect to the gateway. But now I'm exploring the other path, which is the service to user path. So basically I have a user on the application and the user wants to use some of the services. As I mentioned before, we implemented the, the whole architecture using microservices. So when we started defining this, this, this platform, we thought about the typical way of implementing this or the way we, be, we have been implementing this before. So basically we have a number of microservices 
most of the time implemented using HTTP REST uh, APIs. And then I have an API gateway that will be able to route the different um, uh, requests from the user application. Now, the issue here is that what we want and what we need is RPC or remote procedure call, because what we have, as in the example, we have service B and service C interacting with service A. So it's not just publish and subscribe. We need to be able to have um, a, a direct connection between the services and, 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 and remote procedure call. And concurrency is another factor that affects this model. Uh, because I will have multiple users affecting the platform resource state. So basically, multiple users trying to change, for example, switch on the light or switch off the light or collect or, or, or define a speed limit on, on a particular um, car. And this is the, the key aspect of the platform. This, this path should, should be always on. I mean, we should always have a platform that delivers uh, the request for the for the users. So in that sense, we, it was very clear to us that we need to avoid consensus algorithms at different levels, at the storage level, at the remote procedure call control plane, uh, at the publish and subscribe level between those services, and therefore that means we cannot use uh, or Kafka, um, and that we needed to adopt eventual consistency. So what we wanted is a lightweight protocol that allows us to use both communication patterns, RPC and PubSub, ideally within the single protocol. But that protocol is open and extensible. Uh, that is also fine-grained, uh, that allows us to work at the function level, uh, because that facilitates refactoring. When you're starting to break things into microservices, sometimes you go too far and you need to go back. So you need to start consolidating services, and we want a framework that allows us to do that. Also, we wanted to have support for multiple transports and serializations, um, and to be browser friendly. And what we wanted to avoid is this, which basically is how we saw most of the, the architectures using microservices are being implemented. Um, why we wanted to avoid this, because if we start going the route of using a particular message broker for publish and subscribe and a particular implementation of RPC, uh, which, which might demand or not to have an HTTP server within the microservice, then my microservice is not that micro anymore. Then as a developer, I need to know how to connect to a database how to handle HTTP connections, clients and servers, how to do RPC using a particular implementation and how to do PubSub. And that's when we found WAMP. Uh, WAMP stands for the Web Application Messaging Protocol. Uh, it is an open standard and extensible rooted protocol. It implements both PubSub and rooted RPC. It's based on asynchronous message passing. It is session based. It allows multiple authentication schemes multiple serializations, multiple transports, and it's currently implemented in 13 uh, programming languages. So basically, with, with a WAMP router, all these microservices connect and create a session, um, as opposed to a, a normal um, microservice architecture, which an API gateway pushes connections or opens connections to the backend services. In this architecture, is the service that actually connects to the router when it starts up and opens one or more connections to that router. Uh, and it will decide how to communicate, whether using web sockets, TCP, and whether using a number of serializations. Um, JSON and message pack are required by the protocol, but then an, a number of implementations are there that use a number of other serialization uh, technologies as well. So one piece of very simple um, protocol. This is just an example of, of a message. All messages are lists uh, containing what you could define are JSON objects. Um, and this is an example of a subscribe message. So basically, subscribe is number two. Uh, every message has a request ID for that session. Uh, it might have an options object. And in this case, is um, subscribing to a topic called com lipsite example event. So the in interesting thing about um, WAMP is the rooted RPC. So um, the guys who implemented WAMP were very clever to realize that RPC can be analogous to PubSub in the sense that the caller and the colleague don't need to know each other. 
So by reusing the infrastructure that you have in a PubSub architecture, they managed to put together um, an RPC architecture. So the interesting aspects of this is that you only know the function, uh, i.e. the procedure, how, how we call in WAMP. So I don't know who am I calling, I don't know the colleague, I don't know an IP address, I just know the function that I want to call. So the remote procedure is location transparent, which facilitates microservice refactoring because I can extract a function from one service and move it into another service and the caller will never know. Um, there is no version provided by the protocol as with other RPC protocols, but that can be implemented through extensions because it's an extensible protocol. So I'm going to go quickly through um, some examples, go then to code and th then start showing you how this works. So in this case, um, what you're looking at is the whole rooted RPC flow. So I have a colleague who is an implementer of a particular procedure. The colleague needs to register that procedure with the router. Um, once that is registered, then a caller can call, which, which does by sending a call message to the router, then the router analyzes the call message, decides which colleague implementation to call, and in here you will see that you have load balancing implemented by the dealer, i.e. the router, and decides which one to pick and sends that uh, colleague an invocation message, then the colleague can return a yield or an error message. If it is a yield, then the broker will, will turn that into a result to the original caller. If it is an error, it will just pass the error. And in the in, in, in flight, the, the caller can actually cancel the, the RPC, which will send an interrupt message to the colleague, which will reply with an error. So on the right hand, on the left hand side, you can see JavaScript, Node.js code. Um, that actually exemplifies how you can use, how you, do, you can do this in, 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 in a few lines of code. So what we're doing here is we are registering a URI called comlipsi add, and we're defining the function add below. So basically it's a function that takes two arguments and will add and return the, the, the result. Um, so I'm registering that uh, with a number of options. One of the options is a run robin, which means I'm accepting multiple instances of this add function and the router should do a run rowing load balancing on it. Um, this close caller means um, I, so the caller um, has an ID, session ID, so I want the caller to be disclosed so that I can then print it out um, as you will see on, on the screen. In the case of a call, again, very simple. I grab the session, I I do a call um, using the same URI that we defined before, and I pass the arguments. The interesting thing about the arguments in, in WAMP is that you have two types of arguments. You have ordered arguments, it's called the args list, and you have a map as well, is a key args, the keyword ar arguments. So every every call, every procedure can, can, can receive uh, either a number of arguments or just a map of, of, of uh, key value pairs or a combination of the two. In this case, I'm, we are calling and we're passing X, which is a variable that we have somewhere with 42, so we want to add 42 to X, and also we're passing another, uh, an object that says that the client type is um, client type. In this case, we were, we're gonna use it to identify who is calling us. And then you get the result by implementing a function, uh, and then you can get from the result the arguments or the key, uh, the keyword arguments. So it's a very, very simple protocol, as you can see. Again, error handling, exactly the same as with the, the result. In the case of publish and subscribe, it's even simpler. So basically I subscribe to a URI, um, uh, in this case, I have three options. I can subscribe with an exact matching, I can do prefix matching, uh, and I can do wildcard matching, so that I can say, for example, match com wildcard example event, and will match any um, any events of, of, of that sort. And in the end, you provide a callback or an implementation function that will do something with that event. And then to publish, again, very simple. I publish to a URI. In this case, as with the call, I can provide a list of arguments and or a, an object. So I'm gonna show you now some of the code that we will be running. So in this case, I'm, I have 
um, two Node.js uh, services and an Erlang service. Uh, the Node.js service will connect. In this case, it will use WAMCRA uh, authentication, which basically uh, uses uh, hashing on, on both sides. And in, in our case, because it's implemented in Bondi, we use salted passwords. So I'm connecting using WebSockets to the Realm com libsite test. Every session is connected only to one Realm in one and all the users and everything within WAMP happens within a single realm. There is no way uh, two peers or two clients can, can talk um, from two separate realms. In this case, I'm designing to use JSON as a serialization, um, and I'm connected using a particular user. And as you can see, the functions that we mentioned before, um, on challenge is uh, the, the callback that I need to implement to be able to um, authenticate. On open, um, when the session is open, I'm going to do a number of things. In this case, I'm going to register uh, con libsite add, and I'm going to say that the implementation is a function add. And I'm going to log a bunch of stuff that you're going to see running later on. Um, and then this is a function uh, that implements the, the procedure that we are registering. And another thing that we're doing is we're publishing every 10 milliseconds, we're going to be publishing a, an event called comlipsa example event, and we'll have a counter with it. Now, so peer one basically will uh, publish this event and then provide, an AP, uh, provide a procedure that other, other microservices will call. The second, microservices, the second microservices will actually subscribe to that event, um, and every time an event is uh, uh, collected, it will actually call the other API. So on the event, when the, the, when the event happens, it will call the do call function and do call will do a session call to actually call the API. And finally, we'll, we will have a, an Erlang implementation of the um, add procedure as well. So when it comes to one router implementations, the canonical one is called Crossbar and is written by Crossbar IO Technologies, the creators of the protocol. Now there are 15 other implementations in multiple languages. And when we decided um, that we wanted to use one, um, we had an issue and the issue is that all of them lack clustering. So basically there is no high availability option, no failover and no scalability. Now at the moment of writing, Crossbar has announced that is working on um, on, on a multi-node uh, support, but it's not yet ready. Um, so two years ago, that was not the case. And, and basically, we decided to solve the issue by creating an implementation using Erlang. So Bondi is our open source implementation of a WAMP router. It's written in Erlang. It uses the partisan library for cluster membership. I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about partisan later on. Uh, which is a replacement for distributed airline. Um, it uses a real-time gossip-based data replication using eventually consistency uh, because we want Bondi to be um, highly available. So we want we want Bondi to be always available even in the in the case in which the cluster is is broken or there is a, day, or, or a network partition amongst uh, separating the cluster. Um, but Bondi goes a little bit further than uh, uh, a one router and it embeds a role-based access control security system, which is inherited from React Core, uh, which is following the Postgres uh, SQL role-based access control system. It also embeds a REST API gateway, uh, a partial implementation of an OAuth, OAuth uh, authentication server, um, and many other features like a Kafka bridge to be able to move WAMP events to Kafka. So, Using Bondi, this is the, the architecture that we decided to implement. So every microservice will be will run, in this case, our Docker microservice is run by Kubernetes. Everyone will, will run a number of instances. Those instances will connect to the Bondi cluster uh, and will provide, register their APIs, and, and, and each one of them will use the, 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 the right encoding uh, for them. So for example, Node.js, some Node.js services that we're using are using JSON. Most of the Erlang um, 
services that we're using are using Erlang, which we provided as part of Bondi. So if you're talking Erlang to Erlang, there is no um, uh, encoding cost. Um, but also we wanted, as I mentioned before, we wanted to to have um, uh, to have uh, REST, um, REST uh, clients connected. So we implemented an API gateway and we have the user applications talking REST JSON or WebSocket JSON directly to Bondi without knowing that there is WAMP and underneath. So the vision for this was to have smart endpoints and dumb pipes, something that is scalable, reliable, and always on, that is in, that integrates all the messaging requirements that we have, that embeds role-based asset control authorization. We might remove the credentials database in the future and, and be able to connect to, to LDAP, but authorization needs to happen in line when we are evaluating the messages. Otherwise, we will have too much latency. In the future, we see this expanding, and one of the reasons why we are so excited to use Partisan is to expand this as a FOG IoT hub connected to a Bondi cloud. Uh, so a bond in, in, in both in the cloud and in the um, on-premises or in, in the fog um, uh, layer. Uh, we also see adopting CRTs everywhere. Uh, we would love to have CRTs even in the, in the mobile platform. And we see gateways as plugins, so MQTT can be implemented on top of Bondi uh, as well. So let's do... A little bit of, of, of um, so, so let me cover a little bit more, and then we go straight into into showing you how it works. So this is more or less how Bondi's architecture internally. Um, so Bondi um, implements a one router, handling all authentication and session management, RPC and PubSub. Uh, both they leverage a single registry. So every time you register something, uh, is is managed by a try uh, in Bondi. All that data is replicated, uh, is stored in memory, and is replicated through the cluster in real time. And we also use active anti-entropy when a new node gets connected and is empty, as you will see in a minute, uh, the active anti-entropy kicks in and it will take another node and start exchanging data and comparing the data and moving data from one node to, to the other or copying data from one node to, to the other. Uh, we currently support JSON message pack, BERT and, Erl and Erlang uh, encodings. Um, as I said, we uh, have a, an embedded API gateway, an embedded OAuth service, role-based access control, uh, and we recently implemented um, a broker bridge, uh, a Kafka broker bridge, which basically allows you to subscribe to WAMP events and write them to a Kafka topic. Um, we are also implementing telemetry and tracing. We already have Prometheus and, and, and we're now starting to implement open tracing um, within, within Bondi as well. So let's go for a demo. I'm going to switch. No, before we do that, this is more or less what you're going to see. You're going to see a screen with four um, uh, terminals. Uh, the terminal up on the, on, on the left is the uh, Peer One Node.js service that I mentioned before. Uh, that one publishes an event to a topic and implements uh, a procedure. Then I have a copy of that peer um, running on a separate instance that does exactly the same. The difference is that the Peer One is going to be connected to a first Bondi node and the Peer Two is going to be connected to Bondi Two. Then we're going to have the Peer Two that actually is another Node.js service that subscribes to the events published by these other two. And every time it receives one such event, we'll call the implementation of comlipsite add. And finally, we're going to add, and that one is connected to Bondi1. And finally, we're going to add an Erlang service implemented also the same function. And we're going to see how it, how it goes. So I'm going to run Bondi there, and I'm going to explain what's, what's happening um, when I do, uh, because it's interesting. I'm going to run uh, a second one here. So what happens, um, 
I, I have the I have all the logs um, enabled so we can see what what's going on. So Bondi has a stepwise approach when starting. So it will start and open up the administration um, listeners uh, HTTP. There's an HTTP administration API um, and and there's a one administration API as well. Um, but it will start doing a bunch of of of, of stuff until it opens up the connections for the microservices. This gives us the chance to actually start Bondi in order, but also start doing things like, for example, assessing whether we have a database or not. And if we have the database, start building uh, the active anti-entropy hash trees, which is a mechanism, is a Merkle tree on disk that allows us to compare uh, the, the data in two different nodes and decide whether we need to copy data to keep the nodes in sync um, so this is what you're seeing uh, at the moment. So is initializing uh, all the different partitions in this. I have Bondi configured with 16 different partitions. Each partition is a level DB uh, database. Um, and what it's also doing is, is retrieving data, if, if there is any data, from disk to memory, uh, as some entities have both a copy in memory and on disk. And when it finishes, it's going to try and find if there is any configuration file. Uh, there are a number of ways of configuring Bondi, uh, one of which is providing some JSON configuration files. So for example, in this case, it's found a security configuration with the definition of the peer one user, peer two user, and so on and so forth, with all the um, uh, roles uh, and authorizations required for the demo. Um, then we'll re-enable Active Energy Entropy and we'll start um, um, all, all the different listeners so that we can connect. So at the moment we have two Bondi nodes and they are not connected. So I'm going to start peer two. Peer two is connecting and we've seen here that a session has been generated um, and it's subscribed to a topic. There is no event happening at the moment. So we're going to start peer one. Again, peer two is a Node.js application and peer one is a Node.js application as well. Peer one is going to start publishing events. And what it does for every event that is being published, then uh, peer two will call the add function. In this case, the only one implementation is, is, is the peer one. So if I stop here, you can see that I receive an event with a counter from this session, which is peer one session. And as a result of that, I'm calling com libsite add. The only implementation at the moment is this one. So if I stop here, you will see that I publish a topic and I receive a call from this other session, which is peer two, right? So I'm gonna carry on showing that. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect the two bonds together. So, so far, these two are connected to bonding number one. And the easy way to do that is by going here. I'm inside Erlang at the moment, but we can do that through the uh, administration shell. I'm going to connect to the first Bondi, and this is um, using the implementation by Partisan. So Partisan allows us to have multiple TCP connections between these two Erlang nodes, um, and also define the parallelism. So I'm going to explain later on how you do that. So as you can see at the moment, what is happening is that they're both connecting and exchanging data. That happens after a minute or so, and it's configurable. Um, so it's saying that it completely the exchange on partitions zero and there is nothing to exchange. And the, the reason why there is nothing to exchange at the moment, well, here, here we have something to exchange. And what is, what is exchanging here is the um, registration of these, of these um, uh, procedures. So if I go to the HTTP API, I can actually go to node number one and list the registrations and go to number two and list the registrations and now they are in sync. So basically this is telling me that there is a session with this ID that has registered a, a URI, a procedure called com site add. And the registration allows a round robin uh, load balancing algorithm. So now that I have 
that connector, I'm going to connect this peer to the second node, the second bonding node. And what is happening at the moment is that Bondi is load balancing now between these two instances of peer one, all the calls. So as you can see here, I'm calling from session peer one and session two peer one. So these are two separate sessions. So what Bond is doing is load balancing. What I'm going to do now is interrupt. Sorry, is interrupt this one. And as you can see, everything keeps on flowing. Bondi realized there is no more session connected there. So all the traffic, all the RPC calls from peer two below here is being handled by peer one. I'm going to again create a new instance of peer one. And again, we're going to see that we have. So this is the same session as peer one. And now we can see that the two sessions are being handled. The new session is, is, is the number 3378, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to start an Erlang implementation of that same uh, procedure. And this Erlang will connect to the second node. Now, if we go here as well, now we can see that there are two implementations of the LibSite add. And I can target the two different nodes and I'm going to get the same results because they're in sync. So now I'm going to register yet another implementation of the same function. I run the Erlang node, it connects and is already being called. If I go to the API, I should have three. Yes, I have three. Uh, so two Node.js and one uh, in Erlang. Now, um, to, to to wrap it to wrap it up. So what what I can do as well is uh, what happens if this node gets disconnected? So let's crash this node. So obviously, what happens is these two, uh, the second instance of Peer One and the second and the, and the single instance of the Erlang uh, microservices are hard coded to be connected to the second one. Um, in real life, what will happen is they will be configured to connect to a load balancer, and as you can see, there is is trying to reconnect. Uh, so if I ha had I had a load balancer here, it would be already reconnected to node number one. In the meantime, the other two services are, are, are keep on running. I can run again. And hopefully everything will get reconnected again. What's going to happen is in a minute there's going to be um, an active anti entropy exchange between the two nodes, and this node will know everything this other node knows. And there we go, uh, it's already starting and reconnected. We can reconnect this one too. Right. So Back to the presentation a bit. So why are we using Partisan? So Partisan is a, an implementation of a um, clustering and membership um, protocol in Erlang that replaces or can replace distributed Erlang. Um, this was done by Chris Makeljohn. Um, it's part of the LASP project, which is a data flow programming uh, language on top of Erlang and and basically he has recorded significant improvements in terms of scalability latency uh, or reduction in latency and increasing throughput but also what it allows us is to have separate TCP connections per communication class so what we're doing in Bondi and and through partisan and Bondi is that we have a single TCP connection that manages all the control plane and cluster membership another TCP connection that manages the replication and the active anti-entropy that you've seen on, on the shell, and yet another um, connection that manages all the one for wiring. because what is happening when, when this is running is that Bondi is moving calls between, uh, between, between the, two, the two nodes. So for example, when 
a microservice connected to Bondi one makes a call and that call is implemented in a uh, in the peer that is connected to Bondi two then Bondi one will forward that message to Bondi two um, and records a promise so all of that is being done in a separate TCP um, connection uh, which by the way allows us to have parallelism so we can actually do sharding and do multiple TCP connections per channel so again a wrap-up of how uh, bond is implemented um, and I'm going to show you a little bit of the rest um, API gateway in the next slides but basically um, as, as I said before is is written in Erlang uh, it uses partisan for replication and plum tree for um, dissemination using gossip um, our we build our own DB based on level DB uh, is, a, is a variation of the plum tree database that was an extraction from the react core um, so plum DB also works in memory and on disk um, and it allows you to do sharding so at the moment you see Bondi running with 16 different shards each one being a 16 a set of 16 different um, in-memory database tables provided by Erlang but also 16 different uh, instances of level DB so Bondi obviously stores um, um, uh, state and, and, and most of the state in Bondi is global meaning that everything that is written in a node is replicated to the other nodes so these are the kinds of entities that we're currently managing and and and, and and the Russian Y. So RPC registrations are global. So every time a microservice connects to one node of the cluster and registers a procedure, that is replicated in real time to the rest of the nodes. And if one node joins in later on, then active anti-entropy will kick in and in a minute will reconcile the differences. Um, the RPC state, such as for example, the load balancing state is local and that is not replicated. Uh, the pubs subscriptions again is global uh, and those three are in memory uh, then the API gateway specification which we haven't covered but I cover in the next slides is global and is stored on disk the role-based access control ie the user credentials groups grants permission grants and sources meaning that you can in bonded you can define a different type of authentication per IP uh, subnet that, that so if you, you can separate and say for example everyone coming from the internet should use um, strong authentication methods whereas every microservice in my network internal network is trusted and therefore they don't need to authenticate all of that is managed and stored both in memory and disk and is replicated globally and then all the OAuth tokens are also replicated globally and stored only on disk I mentioned before that also that the Bondi also implements an API gateway. So we build something that we call the API gateway specification, which is, I would say, in concept similar to Swagger, although from a syntax point of view, is not. So let me show you um, how we implement such uh, such thing, and also we're going to create a an API, a REST API for the add function without um, actually coding it. So this is an example of the internal uh, Bondi administration API, which you can see here. So I can go and list the registrations. I can go and retrieve the list of users, uh, check the realms. There's going to be two realms, the Bondi admin realm and the test realm that we're using. We can create realms. We can do a bunch of things through this API. but everything that happens through this API is actually calling WAMP. So there is not a single line of code in Bondi specific to these um, API requests. So what happens is that we define an API using this JSON specification um, that might seem very complex at the beginning, but so I'm going to hide some of this stuff and I'm going to say, I'm going to show you, uh, for example, the realms. So by this I'm saying that there is a realms path and you can see the realms path here that I'm, I'm using to retrieve. Now every path um, is either a collection or not, that is 
helps us in, in, in when we generate the code because what we do is we pass this representation and we generate Erlang code and, um, and we're using Cowboy, the embedded HTTP server. So we are actually coding all the paths uh, handlers in Cowboy directly on the fly when you load this uh, at runtime. So I am saying that Realm supports the options method, the get method, and the post method. And so for example, if I do a get, I have an action and a response. An action can be one of three things, a one call, or can be a forward to an HTTP, uh, so, such as what you do with a, a normal API gateway, or it can be a static resource that you want to return. So in this case, I'm doing a WAMP call, and I'm going to call the procedure comlibsibondi security list realms. So basically, this is the WAMP administrator um, API that I'm using directly, uh, that will be using directly from REST. Um, so, and what I say is uh, there, there are no arguments in this call, uh, so I'm passing no arguments. And in the response, if there is an error, then do something. And we're using our own mustache-like language to extract the context of the request. Um, and in this case, on the result, we say, well, from the context, take the action key, get the result, get the arguments, because this is a WAMP argument list, and take the head, and we we'll reply the head. So I'm going to show you how to model a very simple API that, can, that will allow us to um, call. Um, I mean, I'm going to try it here. So here is the curl that I want to do. I want to call Bondi on the HTTP listener and ask Bondi to reply um, uh, to, to, to add these two values, value A and B. So obviously this is uh, in, in demos, everything can go wrong, so bear with me. So I'm defining a new API, I call it demo API spec. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that I need to do, but important thing is here. I'm gonna define a new path that is called services slash add. It's not a collection, it will provide options and post, and the post action will call comlibsite add, which is the function that we just defined in Node.js and in Erlang. And I'm gonna get the arguments from the body. If I do this, the body is a JSON object with two uh, keys, A and B. So I'm gonna say, get the request, get the body, get the A in the body, the key A in the body, and put that as a first argument in the list and do the same with B and put that in the second argument in the list. And on result, take the action result arguments and get the head and return that. And is doing that using uh, JSON or message back automatically uh, based on the, on the curl. So what I need to do in order for this to work is to go to Bondi and load that file. So basically I'm gonna call um, services load API spec and what I'm going to see is that the API has been loaded and now it works. So again, if I call that, I get the result of adding A plus B. So by doing that, I just created an API, a REST API without even coding it. Um, I'm just using the APIs that we have implemented in WAMP in the rest of the, of the platform. So I'm going to switch that off. and go back to a finished number of slides. So uh, in terms of WAMP, WAMP compliance, um, there are two profiles in WAMP uh, according to the specification. The specification is a moving target uh, and it's trying to become an IETF uh, standard. It's currently in draft. Um, there, you're gonna find at the end of the presentation all the, all the links. Um, so how do we stack up at the moment? So uh, we support multiple realms per router we support WebSockets. The serializations that the specification defines are JSON message pack and CBOR was recently added. We don't support CBOR, but we support BERT and ERA. Um, and actually supporting CBOR, uh, if, if required, is an easy thing to do as well. Um, we do RPC routing and we even have our own extension to um, 
to the load balancing algorithm, which takes into account, um, so it uses Erlang to understand how loaded is the peer that is connected and tries to, uh, to do a weight, weighting load balancing um, algorithm with that. Uh, obviously, we do pub sub routing as you've seen. Uh, all the session meta APIs are being implemented. This is a this is a APIs defined by the specification. One API is defined by the, the specification to be able to um, query uh, the router and identify, for example, which user is connected, which sessions are connected, and all, all, all of those. Um, we don't yet support cookie authentication. We support ticket authentication. Um, all passwords in Bondi are salted, meaning we don't store any passwords when when the user creates uh, the credentials and submit the password, then what we do is we co we compute a hash and we store the hash. This is exactly what React KV does internally in the metadata store. Um, and we use that salted password as well for uh, challenge response authentication, which we recently implemented. I still, we still need to integrate that into the main branch, but it's what, you, what you've seen today is WAMPCRA being used by Node.js. Uh, we haven't yet implemented WAM Scrum, which is a new um, authentication method defined by the specification. Uh, we support TCP. Uh, we currently don't support batch messaging. Um, so WAMP allows you to either work in the, in, 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 by sending each, well, each, each the messages individually, or it allows the router and the client to batch um, several messages in one go. Um, and long pole transport is something that we don't uh, yet support, and uh, we, we don't we don't see the need for that at the moment. Um, again, progressive call results that is a way of getting a sort of a stream from a RPC that is returning a very large object. We don't yet support that. That is paired with progressive calls. Uh, we support call timeout, cancelling, uh, call identification, trust levels is in the in being supported as well. Um, and the, the, the big one that we need to support now is um, uh, one of the pattern-based uh, register changes that I mentioned, I will mention in the next slide. Um, so as you can see, most of the requirements in the, in the, in the um, specification are supported, uh, and we even provided um, some extensions um, that we will be documenting. Um, so in addition to all the one features, obviously I've shown you that we have a REST API gateway, uh, and we are the only broker at the moment that is distributed and can actually load balance across the cluster. Um, so the major one thing that we need to finish and is, is, is something that we already need in our um, um, design space is the support for wildcard pattern. At the moment we support uh, exact and prefix matching and we're very close to have wildcard pattern matching um, finished. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the, the branch that I'm running at the moment is that one, the security improvements, and that implements anonymous clients, uh, fixes a uh, bug in WAMPCRA, and it, it enables for the first time per message authorization using role-based access control in Bondi, because we haven't been using that in the IoT platform, but we are now going to be using it. So basically for every message, Bondi's got to verify that the caller, um, in, in the case of our, an RPC, has all the rights, all the permissions to be able to call that. And finally, we're using a deprecated Erlang client, uh, which doesn't uh, work very well with uh, authorization. So we're implemented our own called Chasky, uh, and it's going to be ready soon. And hopefully, we will work with uh, the Elixir community to, to be able to, to, to build a library that works well in both languages. So that's it. Um, so you can find the source code in GitLab. Uh, we are working on a documentation using Gitbook. Um, so what you're going to see in that link is very, very draft. Um, and you can contact us either through Twitter or um, through the web if you, if you want to know more uh, about us or Bondi. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that, Alejandro. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions, as always. So um, we'll start off with this one, which is, uh, can Bondi use an external database for its state? Uh, not at the moment, and uh, we're uh, planning, we're planning to, to be able to do that, especially in, in case of um, 
um, credential management. Uh, so that some of the data wouldn't make sense uh, to use an external database. And the main reason why we're not using an external database is because um, what we found is we, we found ourselves many times designing an architecture that is um, highly, uh, highly scalable and uh, continues available by using uh, NoSQL databases that implement um, uh, eventual consistency, but then to put an API layer that requires a database with consensus. So basically you're building a wholly scalable architecture in the back and you put an API layer that doesn't scale. So uh, what we want to do is to have that embedded or some of those entities embedded in Erlang. So all the service discovery and all the authorization should happen within Bondi, but authentication uh, doesn't need to happen within Bondi. So we might want to um, use uh, an external database or use an, an LDAP. So we, are, we, we have a branch in which we started uh, implementing LDAP, but mainly because we haven't used it yet, uh, we haven't progressed. But if there is anybody interested in that, we, we, can, we can easily um, help, help you with it. Perfect. Cool. Uh, another question we got through is, why does Bondi use an eventual consistency model? For the same reason I just mentioned, we don't want, um, so we don't want to be in a position in which our backend can give you high availability, but then the front end is restricting it. So basically, um, we prefer to deliver um, in, in the same way that you know you, you would choose to use a NoSQL database with eventually consistent in the back. It's the same reason you should be able, or should, you should be choosing to use it in, in in the front. Cool, perfect. And the last question we had through today is. How is WOM different to MQTT messaging like RabbitMQ? Perfect. So, um, in, in principle, they are, they're very similar when it comes to pops up. Um, the main difference between MQTT, well, there, 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 there are a number of differences. So, at the functional level, um, MQTT provides quality of service, so it gives you certain guarantees, um, uh, whereas WOM is uh, fire and forget. So it's, it pops up. It doesn't give you um, exactly once or, or, or at least once. It's at most one semantics. Um, so that's the main difference from, a, from a, a user point of view. That doesn't mean we cannot build that up in Bondi and basically, um, for example, um, I know Crossbar has uh, embedded MQTT and, and we are planning to embed MQTT as well. Uh, so, so it wouldn't be that difficult to, to build that capability and extend one to have quality of service. The one thing that one provides that AMQP and MQTT do not is RPC. I mean, you can do RPC with AMQP, but you're kind of faking it. Whereas in one, RPC is a first class citizen and that's the main reason why I think uh, is, 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 is so interesting. The other big difference between MQTT and WAMP is that MQTT is a binary protocol that um, happens to have, well, a, a very clear separation between the, me the, 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 the envelope and the, and the content of the message, if you, the envelope and, and, and the letter, if you want, or the body. Um, so when you receive an MQTT, you know that the, the, the handler will parse the, the octets in the same way and then it, it knows that this last piece is, is the body. And the body can be JSON, can be Erlang, can be whatever you want. In WAMP, the whole message is a data structure that you encode in the encoding uh, um, technology that you've chosen. So when Bondi receives a message, it is a JSON message, or a list, a JSON list, or an Erlang list, or a, um, or a um, message pack list. So at the moment, we need to unpack the whole message to understand which message this is. And that means unpacking the body and the body might be too big. So we have another branch, which is already working. And basically what it does is it, it, it does a partial decoding of, of Erlang, JSON and message pack. So basically we decode just the first three or four elements of the message to let us know what message this is and we keep the binary, the payload is never encoded. And if I happen to be moving, see if Bondi is happening to be moving a message from Erlang to Erlang, then it knows the tail of that message uh, 
can be reused without encoding and decoding again. Okay. Uh, I think that's that. all we have in terms of questions. Um, so I guess I would like to thank you so much for sharing this with everyone. I hope they got as much out of it as I know I did. Um, and for everyone joining, thank you for joining. As always, we will be sending out the recording of this session. So keep an eye out on our Twitter and our website. If you have any recommendations for future speakers, future topics, or if you'd just like to pass a message on, uh, we're always available on Twitter, Facebook. Um, so yeah, reach out. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time.